Hello, everyone. Welcome to the American Acupuncture Council podcast. My name is Matt Callison. Hi, I'm Brian Lau. We're from AccuSport Education and the Sports Medicine Acupuncture Certification Program. Uh, we want to chat with you today about the Sanjiao channel. So can we get into that first slide, please? All right, yeah, so, so we don't have very much. So go ahead, Brian. Yeah. So we are going to discuss uh, Sanjiao's sinew channel today, uh, a little bit of the topography, a little bit more of the anatomy to start off with, and then we'll um, have a chance to talk about a representative injury of the channel. So uh, that'll give a little preview of what's to come in the next 20 minutes or so. Matt, were you going to say something? Oh, I was just going to introduce that <laughs> you did a great okay. job. Go <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, so uh, this will actually also give a flavor of what we teach in the sports medicine acupuncture certification. E each module, we have an anatomy palpation cadaver lab. Uh, so there'll be some elements of the anatomy that we're going to be teaching and actually a, a class, if you're watching this live, that we're going to be starting tomorrow uh, for the upper extremities. So the San Jiao channel will be one of the many channels that we're looking at, obviously, for the upper extremities. Um, and uh, some opportunity to look at some uh, dissection that we've done that we'll be presenting in our class. Uh, so we'll remind about this, but if you are watching this around other people, we'll give you a heads up before the dissection stuff comes on and give a couple thoughts on that. But you just wanna make sure that there's nobody uh, around you that might be, um, you know, it might be disturbing for some people if they're not uh, medical providers and they're not used to seeing cadaver images. So we'll give ample warning before those videos come on. All right, so let's go to the next slide and we'll start looking at some of the entry uh, anatomy for the channel sinew of the San Jiao channel. So this is from uh, a translation of Vietnamese scholar Van Gi uh, from, from the Ling Shu chapter 13. And if you kind of glance through it, uh, you can see that it gives a, a description of the topography. It, it's kind of vague, you know, the uh, very open to interpretation and, and vague some of the anatomy Descriptions in the Ling Shu from chapter 13 for the channel sinews. Channel sinews uh, have maybe been a little bit less um, explored than the primary channels and, and some of the other secondary channels like low connecting, et cetera. So the channel sinews probably in the history of Chinese medicine haven't been explored as thoroughly. And we've been doing a lot of work within the uh, sports medicine acupuncture program to um, further define and be a little bit more specific on the anatomy of each channel. Uh, including which structures are involved with, with channels, how they link with other channels in terms of um, pairings, you know, like internal, external related channels, how they communicate and work with those, how they work midday, midnight, et cetera. So just to be a little bit more um, specific with the anatomy and a little bit more specific with some of the functional anatomy in particular. So you can kind of glance through and see some, some aspects of the original description, at least translated in English in this translation. So anything to add, Matt? No, this is good. Let's go into the next slide there. Yeah, so right, here Brian, we I want to add a couple yeah. things. Yeah, here we have uh, our interpretation of the um, San Jiao sinew channel. Sometimes we refer to them as sinew channels, channel sinews, Jing Jin, musculotendinous channel, a lot of different translations. Jing Jin would be the, um, the, the pinyin version from the Chinese. So here's our interpretation of that. The San Jiao sinew channel is a little bit um, harder to interpret as it gets higher up into the traps and starts uh, including some of the, um, the, the cervical fascia. And we'll go over that when we get to it. But if you just glance through the list, it's pretty channel-like. We have the fingers, finger extensors on the back of the uh, kind of posterior surface of the forearm. Uh, deep to that uh, included is the supinator. Uh, then the medial head of the triceps. The triceps, there's three muscles, but there's two that are superficial. The long head and the lateral head are more superficial. And then deep to that is a shorter tricep muscle, which is in a different sort of compartment. Um, still a tricep, but it's a deeper one. And that's the medial head. And that's part of the San Jiao sinew channel. The more superficial is part of the small intestine sinew channel. Then as that travels up and connects with the lateral intermuscular septum, that goes into the deltoids into the superficial deep cervical fascia, superficial layer, upper trapezius, SCM, digastric, and up into the scalp. We'll go through that in a little bit more detail. 
in the next several slides. So Matt, you were going to add something to this also? Yeah, I think it's important for us to remember that each one of these muscles in these tissues are all interconnected. Mm -hmm. So this is the reason why when we can treat something, put an acupuncture in distal, how it can signal along that myofascial chain and soften or change pain at a proximal area. For example, if somebody has pain in the SCM, how we can treat some of these different tissues uh, distal from the SCM and start working towards softening that SCM. And is that uh, the bottom line here is that each one of these tissues are fascially connected and they yeah. can be able to carry signals. So I think that's, that's good. So we want to move on to the next slide? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's a good point, Matt, because then that includes um, both channel points that can regulate tension in the sinew channels, but also uh, points that are off channel and maybe include ashi points or muscle motor points and, and et cetera. Yeah, let's go into right. the next. Uh, yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, so if we kind of look at the forearm, we have a more superficial layer of the Sanjiao sinew channel. And like I kind of already alluded to, that is going to start at the, uh, the hand with the uh, tendons of the extensor digitorum communis muscle. So that'll travel then up the posterior part of the forearm, and it's going to attach to the lateral epicondyle. Uh, that fascial linkage that Matt was referring to then from the lateral epicondyle goes right into the uh, lateral intermuscular septum. A lot of people might not be familiar with the lateral intermuscular septum. It's highlighted in green in this image um, that I we put the highlights in, but this uh, image itself is from an anatomy uh, atlas from a uh, German author, Tillman. So you can see that little thin green line just, be just between the biceps and the triceps. So this lateral intermuscular septum is the kind of fascial septum or wall between the biceps and the triceps, and it can transmit force. And in this case, for the Sanjiao sinew channel, it'll transmit force up into the deltoids, particularly into the middle head of the deltoids. So that's uh, more of an overview of that superficial aspect. Um, but also uh, the medial head of the triceps can put tension into the uh, lateral intermuscular septum. So there's a lot of communication between the medial head of the triceps, lateral intermuscular septum, uh, extensor digitorum communis. So those are all fascially linked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. So I guess we can go on to the next one. Next slide. All right, so we have two more images from the same atlas. So the first one on the left, we have, you can kind of see the little tools that are there to move apart. Um, and we're gonna see this on the cadaver video that, that we did. So in, in any of these types of things, everything's so fascially connected that you'd have to have a scalpel to kind of tease away that fascia so that you can then come and move away those compartments and then see deep uh, below in this case, the extensors, the wrist extensors, especially extensor digitorum communis. And what you're seeing is the supinator, which then on the image on the right is a much cleaner image because it has all of that other stuff taken off. So you can see kind of the relationship on the picture of the left and then the deeper structure of the supinator uh, on the picture on the right, also part of the Sanjiao sinew channel. And it especially links, you know, everything has a fascial linkage. This one has a fascial linkage that has a name. Uh, into the lateral intermuscular septum, and that's a radial collateral ligament. So you can see the image on the right really nicely shows that radial collateral ligament that has fascia spreading over the supinator, and then up above it into that lateral intermuscular septum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. So let's go back. Let's say if somebody has that sternocleidomastoid pain, just to be able to keep it consistent. Mm -hmm. We could treat the supinator. We could treat the lateral intermuscular septum. We could also treat Sanjiao 1. We could treat the, the extensor digitorum communis, and all of those mm -hmm. points would end up affecting uh, that part of the SCM that is affected by the San Jiao sinew channel. Yeah, yeah. SCM is interesting too because uh, the San Jiao sinew channel particularly seems to affect the clavicular head. And if there's any trigger point people uh, listening, you might know oh, yeah, the clavicular head kind of refers oftentimes pain into the ear, it can be a headachey. Uh, pain into the forehead and different places, but it often refers into the ear and can cause um, positional vertigo. So then, you know, for me, I started thinking, well, geez, what, what would that make sense for the San Jiao channel to have some kind of effect in the ear? And any, any acupuncturist here would, of course, say, yeah, of course, we have San Jiao 3, San Jiao 5. There's a lot of uh, 
relationships the points on the San Jiao channel with the uh, with the ear. So that's one that has has an interesting correlation. But it, yeah. you know, like Matt was saying, supinate or other ones could be really involved. I just think of San Jiao seven also being the sheet cleft point of that channel is the motor point for the extensor and disus. So that would be another oh, cool. point that you in there too. Yeah, right. that one's in the channel. I don't know if we had that one listed in the list above, but it should be. <laughs> so, all right, we ready to move on to the next slide? Sure. All right, so from the deltoids, and especially the San Jiao channel has a relationship to the middle deltoids, that then, uh, deltoids then go to the um, spine of the scapula and the acromion and they pick up the uh, superficial layer of the deep cervical fascia. Because if you look at the trajectory of the San Jiao sinew channel, it kind of comes from the back and it goes up the neck and then binds to the jaw. There's really no muscle that has that trajectory that way. I guess the platysma, more superficial might, but it's it doesn't seem to make sense for the San Jiao sinew channel. But if you look at this fascia layer of this superficial layer of the deep cervical fascia, it does have that trajectory and, and binds and, and connects them to the, the mandible, to the sort of angle of the mandible and the um, ramus uh, or the body of the mandible. Um, so it sort of follows that trajectory and it wraps around the trapezius, it wraps around the sternocleidomastoid. So it's very intimately involved with both the upper trapezius and the uh, sternocleidomastoid. The digastric is in this region also. Uh, so if you think about the channel as being more of that cervical fascia, um, it might cross and, and include muscles that aren't going in the in the trajectory in the pathway of the channel, but it still has tensional relationships with the SCM. Seems like particularly the clavicular head of the SCM and then the upper trapezius. And upper trapezius is a big muscle. Uh, I would say that particularly relevant are those fibers of the uh, uh, upper trapezius that go from the acromion to C7 which are what you would be needling if you needled the motor point uh, in Matt's book, book, The Motor Point Index, it's referred to as the part two fibers that many people will needle from San Jiao 15, kind of angling upwards into gallbladder uh, 20, 21, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is nice. That needle technique is safe. It's, you, you're not gonna create a pneumothorax mm -hmm. with that and linking the Xiaoyang channels, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Something that we that teach in the SMAC program is acupuncture as an assessment. And this is going back, let's go back to the SCM clavicular pain, so to speak. Maybe somebody's having mm -hmm. a cervicogenic headache that's going to the side of the head in the San Jiao channel. We've provided already a list of different points that we could use that would help to, let's say, change range of motion or start to decrease that headache. So acupuncture is an assessment. If somebody has that type of headache and maybe they have limited range of motion, they have a forward head posture. If we put the acupuncture needle into the extensor digitorum communis motor entry point and then had the person move to see if that actually changed the chi within that Sanjiao myofascial mm -hmm. channel. Or we could use, of course, Sanjiao 1, Sanjiao 7, the lateral intramuscular septum, so we're providing a number of different tissues that you can use for either a proximal injury or a distal injury. Using acupuncture as assessment is really nice because it's just giving you some ideas of what points actually make the greatest effect on that orthopedic evaluation, on that range of motion, on that pain. Then you would take that needle out, and then when you're actually going to be needling the patient, you'll include that needle back in as part of the point prescription. Okay. I hope that was clear. Yeah, you already you already saw immediately that it had an effect on the dysfunction. Mm, yes. With the assessment yeah. part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So do we now go into the next, next one? slide? Is a conversation about the cervical fascia. Go for yeah. It, so this is a, a image that's put together from this uh, professional software, Zygo Body. Uh, they don't have the little lines that are drawn. I, I painstakingly put those in through uh, through a Illustrator like program, but um, because I wanted to show the fascia, because these programs, these three D programs, are very clunky. You know, it has a muscle like the deltoids and traps, and they're like putting Legos on, um, which is not how the body is. When you see the the cadaver dissection, obviously, you'll see this very clearly. So I I put those uh, white lines on to sort of show the the fascia coming up from the middle deltoids 
sweeping through the uh, upper trapezius, going across the SEM. I say across, but actually both the um, SEM and the traps are embedded, kind of surrounded in that uh, superficial layer of the deep cervical fascia. So it goes on both sides of the SEM and then goes to the mandible and links up with some of the fascia and the jaw and up into the temporalis uh, fascia, which would include the temporalis muscle. In that case, you can also see those little uh, ear muscles that move uh, and stabilize that region of the uh, of the ear. Um, but the temporal, temporalis fascia and the, uh, the tempor temporalis muscle is interesting because that's another point. And I think that you have this in the motor point index as, as having, you can treat the motor point for headaches and various reasons, but this one has a um, empirical use of, of uh, reducing tension in the upper trapezius. Ipsilateral, so yeah. another yes. point. Yeah. <laughs> And you can see through the fascia how that would be be very much linked and, and help communicate that that uh, tensional relationships between the two. Mm -hmm. yeah, great. So you know the take home. There's a lot of things that are surrounded by this fascia, but really clinically, the upper trapezius, especially those fibers that are kind of horizontal connecting to C7, those part two fibers and the clavicular head of the SCM that you have you can access from the motor point kind of in the region of stomach nine and angling through the muscle, but you can also get really good access to it through Sanjiao 16 and angling from Sanjiao 16 cross belly into the posterior portion of the SEM and, and uh, um, connecting into that clavicular head. We have a video on um, the YouTube channel, Sports Medicine Acupuncture YouTube channel that shows both of those, um, both, uh, both the needle directions for the motor point and through that Sanjiao 16. All right, so the next slide is going to be Sorry, Brian, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, I said I think that's the uh, it for the intro, yeah, and I think we're getting ready for the cadaver. Why don't you set this up, Matt? Sure, yeah. So let's just make sure that, again, some people, if they do see this um, passing by your computer or such, are really not going to enjoy it very much. It can actually really affect them deeply. So let's be really careful of where we're observing the following video, which is going to be of a cadaver dissection. Um, let's make sure that there's no screenshots, uh, no sharing of the recordings, and no downloading, please, with this. We don't want to share this kind of information. This is just for us medical professionals to be able to learn from. So then can we now see the video, please? And then I believe there's... So we'll look at the San Jiao Sinu channel, starting with the forearm. We have the extensor digitorum communis exposed, extensor digitorum communis in a different fascial compartment than the extensor indices. So a different fascial compartment than the extensor indices. There we go. And a different fascial compartment than the extensor digiti minimi. So indices, digiti minimi. So we'll put those back into place so we can see them in relationship. Extensor digitorum communis comes up the arm, attaches to the lateral epicondyle. It also communicates into the lateral intermuscular septum, but has a communication into the med medial head of the triceps, which is a, a little part of it on the lateral aspect there. Medial aspect of the triceps also puts tension into that lateral intermuscular septum. So San Zhao has more to do with the medial head of the triceps. All the way up, communicating with the deltoids. We feel that that communicates more through the middle fibers of the deltoids and then into that portion of the upper trapezius that attaches to C7. So those part two fibers of the upper trapezius. And another point, we'll be able to do a little bit more dissection and start to look underneath these structures to see the uh, supinator, which we're starting to see a little bit of the supinator right there, part of the San Zhao channel. All right, great. So let's get to the next slide. All right, so some of the common injuries associated with this particular myofascial gingin will be distal, the EDC tenosynovitis. So the on the wrist itself, the tendon that is going to be in the middle of Sanjiao 4 and extra point Zongchuan. This is a common area for wrist tenosynovitis of the extensor digitorum communis. 
and also supinator syndrome. So the supinator being deep to large intestine nine, and we're going to actually talk quite a bit about the supinator. We're going to highlight it in this podcast because it's a great uh, mimic for lateral epicondylitis. Um, this particular podcast also um, will parallel the blog that we have on the sports medicine acupuncture website, sportsmedicineacupuncture.com, where we discuss supinator syndrome. And we've got um, a couple of videos also, including a myofascial release technique that's very effective for helping to release the supinator. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more. So another injury that you can get in the Sanjiao Jingjin will be lateral epicondylitis, in particular when the extensor digitorum communis is involved, which it commonly is. However, with lateral epicondylitis, we also have the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis, and those will be more in the large intestine sinew channel. So the lateral epicondylitis will be the EDC or the extensor digitorum communis involvement. Then we have our tricep strain, which can occur around San Jiao 10 and actually go all the way even the lateral following that San Jiao channel toward the anconius. The medial head of the triceps, which is involved or categorized within the San Jiao Jing Jin, is one of the more frequent muscles out of the three triceps that become strained that can cause um, a tendinopathy there around San Jiao 10. Then, of course, as we discussed earlier, any kind of muscle tension headaches that might be contributed from that cervical fascia and also the um, um, looking at the clavicular head of the SCM. So let's let's focus a little bit more now on the supinator syndrome, like I said, which it can it can mimic lateral epicondylitis because it does attach to the lateral epicondyle. So let's go to the next slide, please. So the supinator being the deep layer that you saw in Tillman's images. So if we took the extensors off on this image, you're going to see that supinator that you also saw in the cadaver dissection. So the radial nerve, as it comes down from C5, C6, C6, C7, follows along the San Jiao channel. Around large intestine 11 region, it actually bifurcates. So the superficial radial nerve travels along the large intestine channel. And then the other bifurcation is the deep branch of the radial nerve. It's also called the posterior interosseous nerve. So deep radial nerve and posterior interosseous nerve is synonymous. That posterior interosseous nerve dives down through the supinator, through this fibrous canal card called the arcade of frost. <laughs> now with overuse in the supinator, either being in a locked long or a locked short position, it can entrap that posterior interosseous nerve and cause a paresthesia along that San Jiao channel, but it can also mimic lateral epicondylitis. So lateral epicondyle can actually be a little bit tender in that region, but most of the pain is gonna be around large intestine nine region. Let's go to the next slide. So this is from a previous dissection that we've had. You can see that the radial nerve is there on the left. The, the blue ribbon there, which is actually a surgical glove just cut up, tied around. So you can see that bifurcation. So the elbow is gonna be where that blue glove, that blue little ribbon there, that's the bifurcation. So you can see that posterior interosseous nerve traveling through the supinator muscle and then exits and follows along the San Jiao channel. If that muscle, like I said, from overuse entraps that nerve and that can cause a paresthesia within that region, within the San Jiao channel, it will cause pain around large intestine, large intestine nine, large intestine 10 deep, but it can also cause pain around lateral epicondyle. So it could mimic lateral epicondylitis. So a differential diagnosis is going to be needed. Lateral epicondylitis will not have a paresthesia. If there is pain at the lateral epicondyle and there is a paresthesia, especially traveling in the supinator region, San Jiao channel, then you think supinator syndrome. Brian, you want to say anything about that or should we jump right into assessment? Something simple and it's not as relevant for supinator syndrome, but that uh, superficial branch of the radial nerve then travels down the LI channel. Uh, as Matt said, it goes uh, deep to the brachioradialis. So you can kind of see on that left edge of the slide, you can kind of see the brachioradialis pulled off to the side. So then that, that uh, branch of the nerve goes deep to the brachioradialis. Just that, that's all just to add that in. All right, cool. All right, let's go to the next slide. Let's talk about some assessment. So when a patient comes in with lateral elbow pain with possible paresthesia into the lateral form along the course of the San Jiao channel, you're starting to think more supinator syndrome than true lateral epicondylitis. 
Now, palpation to the supinator muscle will be very tender and possibly elicit paresthesia. You want to compare symptoms to the supinator muscle on the opposite side. That's always going to be very important. The supinator manual muscle test repeated four to six times will often create pain in the large intestine nine region, large intestine 10 region, maybe even lung five. And it might extend along to the lateral epicondyle as well. So we're going to actually go over that manual muscle test. Uh, Mills test and Cousins test, those tests are for lateral epicondylitis. So therefore, if you use Mills test and Cousins test, and they do elicit pain at the lateral epicondyle, then possibly there is some extensor involvement as well. However, if there's paresthesia, please think about the supinator. Now, the patient may also report that the forearm and hand feel weak, heavy, or also uncoordinated. Because of this nerve entrapment, it can cause muscle weakening. So let's go to the next slide, if we would, please. All right, so Cousins test and Mills test, most people already know what those are. If not, it's, it's very simple to be able to YouTube that, Google it. Um, it's their, their common test. Now, the supinator manual muscle test is not so common. By putting the patient into this particular position, and you're going from a supinated position, you're gonna to try to break them out of supination and going into pronation. Now, if you do this four to six times, if the person does have supinator syndrome, many times it'll become sore in the large intestine nine, large intestine 10 region, and it may also start to elicit that paresthesia. So you can use this manual muscle test as confirmation. All right, so let's talk about where the actual motor entry points are from the radial nerve into the supinator. All right, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so there's two. One's going to be approximately one to one and a half soon distal and one soon or half a soon radial to lung five. So if you take your finger and put it on lung five, please, in that cubital crease, you're going to be on the radial side of the biceps tendon in the elbow crease, lung five. Now move about one to one and a half soon distal toward the wrist. Now go a half a soon to the radial side. Deep to this region here is going to be one of the motor entry points onto the supinator, which we're going to have a video that's going to describe this a bit more in, in detail. Now, if you can go to deep to large intestine nine, so large intestine nine is going to be three soon down from large intestine 11. All right, so we're going to separate the brachial radialis and the extensor digitorum uh, uh, extensor digitorum radialis longus, separate those tissues to large intestine nine, press against the radial bone, which is usually a great sensation. Mm -hmm. And that will cause quite a bit of sensate, quite, quite a bit of pain in that area. That's going to be another motor entry point for the supinator. So let's take a look at the next video, which is going to describe the location and then also the needle technique. And then after that, we can take any questions that you guys may have or we can have some uh, closing comments. The supernator muscle has two motor points. One's gonna end up being distal from lung five, and the other one's gonna actually be located at large intestine nine. So let's take a look here. So from lung five, we know that's gonna be in the cubital crease here on the radial side of the bicipital tendon. If we drop inferior one to one and a half soon, just depending on the size of the patient, and then we go to the radial side one soon. Now, palpate and you'll feel the brachioradialis. From that brachioradialis at this location, you'll divide the brachioradialis and you'll fall right into a space. Now from this space here, if we just keep massaging that tissue, keep massaging that tissue, okay, separating the brachioradialis, Okay, now I can have the patient, which is in supine, he's in supination right now, he's going to go into pronation, and now go into supination, and I can feel that tissue popping up. I'm going to adjust my finger, I feel a little bit more here, from supination, now into pronation, there we go. Okay, so then, the needle technique would be looking at the supinator from this location, which is one, one and a half, and a half soon lateral, separating the space between between the brachioradialis and opening that tissue up toward that bone so you're going to be kneeling 
perpendicular, and you saw how I found that supinator by going to pronation and supination to the skin directly toward that radius. Now let's be mindful that the brachial artery is going to be traveling along that pericardium channel, so we want to make sure that we're not needling deep into the pericardium channel in this region. So the needle technique for this particular point will be right toward that radius. Now we can also needle the supinator based on large intestine 9. So large intestine 9, we find large intestine 11, which is going to be at the end of the transverse cubital crease, to large intestine 5. We know that this is going to be 12 soon. So large intestine 9 is going to be 3 soon inferior because the space between 11 and 10 is 2 soon. So from large intestine 5 to large intestine 11, let's divide that in half. There's our 6 mark, right? So then now if we divide 11 and the halfway point in half, that will be 3 soon, which will be large intestine 9. Large intestine 9, 3 soon down from large intestine 11. So again, let's feel for that brachioradialis. I can quickly do a little manual muscle test or resistive test for the brachioradialis. I'm going to have the patient just press up against me here and that brachioradialis, a little bit harder, everybody, and that brachioradialis pops right up here. All right, so then now I'm just going to separate between the brachioradialis and the extensor carpi radialis longus and press right into that radial bone, which is going to be pretty darn tender for him. And I can feel that the supinator muscle start to pop up when he goes into supination. Pronation is lengthening. Supination, there it is right there. I'm going to needle here at large intestine 9 directly toward that radius. So we've located large intestine 11, we've located large, large intestine 9, which is 3 down from 11. We've identified where the brachioradialis is. Now we're going to just slide our finger right in that crevice between the brachioradialis and the extensor carpi radialis longus. Separate that tissue there. Separate the tissue and I can feel that radius. All right, so then now Moving into supination, I feel the muscle pop up. Pronation, I feel it sliding. I feel the muscle pop up into supination. All right, so the needle technique is going large intestine nine directly toward the radius. And then we propagate. This muscle is innervated by the posterior interosseous nerve or the deep radial nerve, which is a branch. The superficial nerve goes to the large intestine channel, and the deep branch comes down the posterior interosseous nerve, or deep radial synonymous, which then goes into the arcade of frost for the supinator syndrome. And that's a lecture that we have in this particular program, in this particular module. This is gonna be supinator at large intestine nine. Let's take a look at how we're gonna needle the supinator from the uh, lung channel. Lung five, we drop down one and a half. We move to the radial side a half, maybe three quarters of sun. Sometimes it's one sun, depending on the size of the patient. Feel for the radius, that's gonna be your key. Now we're gonna separate the brachioradialis here. All right, so on this side of the brachioradialis. Okay, and I can have the patient pronate and supinate, and I can feel the muscle pop up with supination. We insert directly toward the radius. and propagate. Okay. So the two motor points for the supinator, that's how we would treat that. But of course, that's just treating the supinator. We'd have to include more points to be able to soften that, that Sanjao sinew channel and also look at the person's posture as well. Um, those were just two points to be able to need the supinator. Again, we can go into extensive digitorum communis, Sanjiao 1, Sanjiao 4, lateral intramuscular septum, the medial head, going into the clavicular head of the SCM to help to connect the entire Sanjiao channel with that. And then, of course, giving exercises that will help with the pronator teres and, op op and the supinator. Many times the pronator teres will be in a locked short position and need to be stretched, and the supinator will be strengthened. But, of yeah. course, 
there's never an always with all of this. So it has to be assessed properly with that. Yeah, and the pronator teri is part of the pericardium sinew channel. So it makes sense to treat that for both reasons. Yeah, good. So internally and externally related, of course. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, that's it for our sand job yeah. channel. That was it Actually, in a nutshell? Quick question, uh, just because I think other people might have it too. Um, and I think you said it, you're treating both of those points or is there clinically a reason why you treat one or the other of them? Um, or is it really both for supinator syndrome? I like to treat both of them because it is such a, a, a long muscle with a number mm -hmm. of different attachments to it. So usually I'll try to be able to get both because if I miss one, then I'll probably get the other. Yeah, <laughs> got it. Yeah, good question. Thanks for saying that. All right. Well, Brian, was there anything else that you want to close this out with? No, no. As usual, of course, thanks uh, to American Acupuncture Council. Yes. Great having the opportunity to do these webinars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for attending. We, we really, really appreciate this. And also, oh, you just see that coming up. Lauren Brown is going to end up being here next week. If you have not um, heard Lauren uh, speak before. He's very energetic. He's very knowledgeable. He's a great person as well. So that's going to be a good show for next week. Um, Brian, thank you very much. It's always a fun time with you. And thanks, thank everybody. You. Really appreciate it. Have a great one now. Bye-bye.